Genesis chapter 17. Uh, we read from there this morning. And it says, and, and God said, um, when Abram was 90 and 9 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. Hallelujah. And uh, the phrase here where it says, um, well, actually, I, I got to read the other things because they're, they're relevant to this particular, what I'm sharing. We need, really need to read through verse 4. And I'll make my covenant between me and thee, and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abraham fell on the floor, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. And then he goes on through verse 8 and continues reiterating the fact it's a covenant between God and Abraham and uh, so forth. So, now God said to Abraham, or Abram at the beginning of this, he is Abram at the beginning, becomes Abraham by the time they're done, this discussion. Um, he says, I am the Almighty God. Now, the Almighty God comes from the, the phrase El Shaddai in the Hebrew, meaning the all-sufficient God of the God who's more than enough. Amen. The Almighty God, King James translates, others do. She says, I'm the Almighty God of the God who's more than enough. Genesis 17, 1. Um, El Shaddai, Shad coming from the Hebrew word for breast. And Shaddai meaning the many-breasted one, meaning I have all the supply, I have all the nourishment, I have everything you have need of, therefore the all-sufficient God. Amen. Or um, the Almighty God or the all-sufficient one. In other words, God has everything you have need of. Can you say amen? amen. Hallelujah. And so God appears to Abraham and says, I'm, I'm, I'm El Shaddai, the Almighty God, the all-sufficient one. He says, I'll be a God to you. I'll make my covenant with you. God's in covenant with Abraham. Now, God made a covenant with Abraham, but that covenant, as we find out later, as we get into the uh, Levitical law, it had blessings and curses. All covenants are, are based on a relationship. The, the, the Abrahamic covenant, the Mosaic covenant, the Adamic covenant, and even the New Covenant are based on a relationship. In other words, there are responsibilities and signs we uphold and live in. Amen? Hallelujah. Uh, now, strength of the, now, one aspect of how strong this covenant was between God and Abraham was, we find in Genesis 18, 17, and 18, the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. Now, this was in reference to God about to wipe out Sodom and Gomorrah. And he says, Shall I hide this? Why? Because I'm in covenant with Abraham. So God views that covenant relationship as a strong relationship. There's no, there's no um, you know, God can do whatever he wants to do. God says, look, I've got a covenant with Abraham. Can I, shall I hide what I'm going to do from him? And then when he comes and talks to Abraham about it, Abraham begins to intercede for Sodom and Gomorrah. He said, will not the Lord of the earth do right? Peradventure there be 50 righteous people in the city. Will, will you spare? And he says, I'll spare it for 50. And Abraham comes back again and says, now look, for 40 will you do it? For 30, for 20? Amen. I think he got him down to 10 and quit. If he just said for Lot's sake, he'd have got it done. But he stopped at 10. And, uh, but anyway, the fact is that God came down to share with Abraham. Abraham began to argue the case. Now, here's, this is a covenant relationship between God and Abraham to the point that God says, I can't hide what I'm going to do from him. And when he does tell Abraham what he's going to do, Abraham begins to intercede, and God begins to respond to his intercession. Amen. See, we, we, got, we got a whole lot of people in the church who think God's going to do whatever he wants to do, and there's always a reason he does it, and never, and never take the as, aspect of arguing, uh, arguing the case or intercession on the other half, on behalf of, of the other group. So we got to, we've got to learn that God, that, that our relationship with God through our covenant is a strong relationship. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, within the covenant, you know, God, God gets over here and we get into the law, and then we get to Deuteronomy 28, and there is a... Uh, the chapter of Deuteronomy, 28th chapter of Deuteronomy, is full of um, blessings and cursings. Now, I'm not going to read all the curses. There are too many verses. But let's just kind of look at uh, Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 1 through 14. And it shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe and to do his commandments, which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth, and all these blessings shall come on thee. Hallelujah. And overtake thee, if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. Blessed shalt thou be in the city. Well, where are we right now? We're in, we're in the city right now, so we're blessed. And blessed shalt thou be in the field. Well, if you go out and farm tomorrow, you'll be blessed. Blessed shalt thou be in the, um, well, or in the you can say field, be the county or the country. So, amen. Um, blessed shalt thou be in the fruit of thy body, the fruit of thy ground, the fruit of thy cow, the increase of thy kind, the flocks of thy sheep. Blessed shalt thou basket. 
and thy store, blessed shalt thou be when thou comest in, and blessed shalt thou be when thou goest out. Now that pretty much covers everything. Just that one verse. If you're blessed when you come in and blessed when you go out, then you've come in somewhere and you've gone out somewhere, you're blessed. Yes. All right? <clears throat> Which makes everything else redundant. God's redundant on the blessing. Amen? The Lord shall cause thine enemies that rise up against thee to be smitten before thy face. They shall come out against thee one way and flee before thee seven ways. The Lord shall command the blessing. What the blessing? What the blessing? Not a blessing, the blessing. Blessing of Abraham. Amen? Upon thee of thy storehouses, and all thou settest thine hand unto, he shall bless thee in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. The Lord shall establish thee a holy people unto himself, as he has sworn unto thee, if thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God, walk in his ways. And all the people of the earth shall see that thou art called by the name of the Lord, they shall be afraid of thee. And the Lord shall make thee plenteous in goods, and the fruit of thy body, the fruit of thy cattle, the fruit of thy ground, the land which the Lord thy God, uh, which the Lord swear unto thy fathers to give thee. The Lord shall open unto thee his good treasure, the heaven, to give rain unto the land in a season, and to bless all the work of thy hand, and thou shalt lend to many nations, and thou shalt not borrow. And the Lord shall make thee the head, and not the tail. Thou shalt be above only, and thou shalt not be beneath. If thou hearken unto the commandments of the Lord thy God, which I command thee this day, to observe them and to do them, and thou shalt not go aside after uh, any of the words which, uh, any, not go aside from any of the words which I command thee this day, to the right hand or to the left to go after other gods to serve them. So God gives them uh, 14 verses of blessing with some conditions. What's the condition? Obey his commandments. To obey his word. God always expects the believer to do what his word says. Now, there's, a, there's a people running around the world today in the country and saying, you know, that it doesn't matter what I do, God's going to bless me anyway. Well, that's not really true. If you look at um, 2 Corinthians, Paul writes to the church and says, you know, that people who are blessed financially are blessed because they, he gives seed to the sower and bread to the eater, and he multiplies their seed sown. And if they give, amen, as he purposes in their own heart, amen, and God blesses them according in accordance with that. If you read that whole passage on giving and so forth, you find out without your cooperation and your obedience to do what God said to do, you won't be blessed financially. Amen. Romans chapter 6 makes it very clear that if you don't, um, if you sow to the flesh, you will let the flesh reap corruption. If you flow sow to the Spirit, you'll flow to the Spirit reap life eternal. There's, there's just too much in the New Testament. We don't have time to cover all the scriptures. There's a bunch of them. Uh, the ones that our body leaves out. There's just, there, you, know, so, you know, there's people who go, well, you know, I, I don't, you know, uh, I don't believe in any commandments. You know, that's, that's works, that's law, that's we're in the grace. <clears throat> no, it's, it's obedience to do what God said to do. God has always, starting from the beginning of creation, had an arena of submission and obedience to his word in order to walk in what he has provided for you. Starting with the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the Garden of Eden. They may eat of any fruit, any, of, of any tree in the garden except the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They weren't, see, that was, that was a commandment of obedience to walk in the blessings. Can you say amen? amen. All right. Amen. You know, and if they didn't do that, they weren't blessed. In other words, actually a curse came on them because it, Adam and Eve did that. I was in a discussion with a blogger one day on the Internet, and I said, you know, even in the beginning before Adam and Eve sinned, when they were creations of God in purity and so forth, God gave them a commandment not to do something as an act of obedience and, and proof of their obedience to his word. And this person said back to me, they didn't have the Holy Ghost like we do. They, God took his spirit out of him and put it in the bodies and made them alive, and there was no sin in them. And they, knew, knew, they didn't know sin. They didn't know death. And they didn't have the Holy Ghost like we did. I mean, you know, what, what planet are you from? Looney Tune planet, you know? I mean, up until that time, they, they were in a better state. Actually, they were in a better state than we are right now. Now, we have a promissory note of the redemption of our bodies, but your body's not redeemed. It's still immortal. A corruptible body. We know at the rapture of the church, it shall become incorruptible and it shall become immortal. Right now, our spirits are born again. We renew our minds and our bodies have a promise. Read your Bible. <coughs> Adam and Eve didn't have anything wrong until they sinned. And then when they committed high treason, in an act of disobedience to the command of God. God always has, there's always conditions. You know what? People don't get saved. You've got to believe. 
salvation is provided, but you still have to believe. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. You don't get saved unless you call. It's provided for the whosoever, but the whosoever don't get it until the whosoever calls. And this, that's really, this is really um, uh, simplistic of this aspect of what I'm saying right now. Uh, it, would take, it would just take hours to go over all the scriptures to disprove uh, the mindset that things come on you no matter what just because, you know, just because you're under grace. Uh, there is always throughout scripture, there's always been throughout scripture, conditions. Everybody say Conditions. You know, prosperity is not going to come on you unless you do with the seed what you're supposed to do with the seed. Amen? But he, Paul said, Paul said, he who sows sparingly shall reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully shall reap bountifully. Well, if you sow nada, you get nada. Amen? All right. So anyway, there's these blessings that God gave them, and, and, and so we have here um, in, in this, this relationship uh, blessings, but then, and, and a lot of this was a lot of the clarification was added because of man's actions. He picks up in verse fifteen, goes to the end of the chapter, and starts talking about. But if you don't do what the Lord says, uh, all these curses are going to come on you. And pretty much the verse, like verse one through fourteen, cursed shall you be in the city, and cursed shall you be in the field. You'll be cursed when you come in, and cursed when you go out. I mean, your cattle will be cursed. Everything's going to be cursed, so forth. And then he starts adding to it. I mean, it gets worse. I mean, the curses, you know, blindness and astonishment of the heart. I mean, they're going to have, uh, uh, I can't even think of all the things he said in here. One of the translations was it was tuberculosis, all kinds of stuff. And, and, then, and then any of the diseases that hadn't come on magicians were going to come on them anyway. Things they hadn't even thought of yet. See, that's part of the curse. Everybody said part of the curse. Now, now just for a note's sake or, or side note's sake here, in uh, verse 28 of Deuteronomy chapter uh, 14, it says there that God would smite them with certain things. And uh, Dr. Young, in his Bible, the Lord shall smite thee with madness and blindness and astonishment. Throughout this whole passage where the word smite is used, or um, Dr. Young says this in his book, Help, Hints and Helps to Bible Interpretation, that the, uh, it should have been translated, allowed to be smitten, because God's not actually the smiter. Okay? Now here's the deal. When you're walking with God, there is protection. When you walk away from God, you walk out from his protection. He don't have, he doesn't have to smite you with something. You get out from under his protection, and you can get smitten. Now, when my children are young, I protect them, I guard them. But if they got away from me and ran out in the road, I didn't throw them in the road to get them killed, but they got out from under my protection and a car come by. Okay? So I, I wasn't the one who, who made them go out in the road. They ran out in the road, got out, from my, my, got out of my protection, and ran out in the road. The car did it. It's just the, na the nature of the fallen world is there. You get out from under God's hand and God's protection, and things happen because that's what's going on in the world. All right? But if you walk with him and walk in his covenant and walk in his plan, uh, so God's not the smiter. And so uh, Dr. Young said that, that it should have been translated to be allowed to be smitten in the sense that um, you, you, you went and did it, and he couldn't stop it in that sense that you were doing, you were doing what you wanted to do. Amen. Now, if Nathan goes out and, and says, hey, I'm climbing a tree and I can't get over and stop him, you know, you can say he allowed him to do it. Well, I allowed him, I allowed him to do it in the sense that he, he got out and did his own thing against my will. You know, you, get, you, go against, you go contrary to the will of God, you're going to get in trouble. I'm in the grace that don't matter, God. No, no, I'm sorry. You go contrary to the will of God, you're going to get yourself in trouble. You're going, to put yourself, you're going to position yourself. Just as you can position yourself for good things to happen and blessings to come on you, and as us old Pentecostals used to say, we get under the spout where the glory comes out. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, you get yourself out from under the spout, you can get yourself over in, under, under the enemy's flow and get yourself in trouble. Amen. All righty. So um, th that was just a little side note there. You know, God is a good God. He provides the abundance of all things, Deuteronomy 28, 47. Now, Jesus came to fulfill that Abrahamic covenant. Remember, God said, I'm going to make a covenant between me and thee. Um, and Jesus said, Matthew 5, 17, Think not, think not that I am come to destroy the law of the prophets. I am come uh, not to destroy, but to fulfill. Jesus came as a fulfillment of the, prophecy, the, the covenant of Abraham. Amen. And then Romans 10, 4 says, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. 
If you don't believe, it don't work. See, this is where universalists get in trouble. They'll, they'll come along and say, well, God's not willing that any should perish, but all should come to the knowledge of the truth. Well, that's one scripture taken out of the setting of the Bible. You can go out there and preach that everybody's going to be saved. God's not willing that any should perish. Amen? Well, the truth is, we go and find in the book of Revelation that people's names are blotted out. That all those who came before the throne and whose names were not blotted out of the Lamb's book of life. Well, the, obviously, if you're looking for blood, if you're finding names that weren't blotted out, some were. Amen? Or it wouldn't talk about names being blotted out if you couldn't be blotted out. And what happened? Whenever, when, when Jesus went to the cross, God saved everybody as far as he was concerned. But the scripture demands the belief to receive it. And so when people didn't receive it, they got blotted out. When they die without Jesus, their names are blotted out. Sad story. I mean, how, how would you like to be in hell? Uh, nobody would. Nobody really would. Only, only drug addict, hippie, dope-smoking, freako, acid-dropping, nut fruitcakes wanting to go to hell. And even then, they think they're getting out. They think, they think Led Zeppelin gave them the key of the stairway out of hell into heaven. You know? And they think that there's a stairway, and, the, 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 and then the eagles, talk, the eagles got kind of a revelation and started start thinking about the Hotel California, which was a type of hell. You know, and they would have this big party. You can come in, but you can't ever leave. Yeah, that was the deal, pal. You can't get out. And there's not a real party going on down there. Hello, the only one partying is the devil, and he's not really having fun. He just thinks he got over on God a little bit. Are y'all here? You're going home. So you have to believe, even... <clears throat> even though people's names are in the book, if they die without Jesus, their names get blotted out of the book. Now, that's not, that's not a joyous thought, to spend, to spend eternity in hell knowing my name was in the book, and if I had just accepted him, it wouldn't have got blotted out. But because I rejected him with my atheistic, godless viewpoints, you know, and saying, dog, I trust, and had the little Darwin fish in the back of my car, and all the stupid mind stuff that people do, you know, trying to be cool, you know, it's not cool to go to hell. I said, it's not cool to go to hell. That would be an oxymoron to be cool in hell, wouldn't it? You know? Now, hell is, hell is a real place, and hell is a place of torment. And uh, you, you can not believe in it all you want to, but it's there. And there ain't no dog going to get you out of hell. You know, have y'all seen that bumper sticker? And dog, I trust. And you, instead of God, I trust. And dog, I trust. And they'll... You'll usually have a Darwin fish on the car or something. You know, uh, the, 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 the Christian's fish sign with feet on it, and it's a fish growing out of evolution. And they'll put, Jesus in, they'll put Darwin in there instead of Jesus because they're just mock. They're just, see, they've gone to some college somewhere with a skull full of mush and some liberal atheistic professors filled them up. There's no such thing as God and stuff. And they went out and think they're really cool, man, because I don't believe in God. I, you know, when you die, you die. Oh, really? You know? Well, here's the deal. If you're right, and I'm wrong, it won't matter. If I'm right and you're wrong, you got a long road to hope, pal. Because you, were, you messed up. Big time. So Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. So Jesus came to fulfill the law. To fulfill Abrahamic covenant. Jesus came to make a way for us where there was no way. Amen? Now, in his redemptive work, Christ not only saved us spiritually so that we could be redeemed to the Father, he redeemed us. Now, now Brother Hagin had a, had a book in a teaching series, sorry, sorry, a teaching series, obviously, called Redeemed from Poverty, Sickness, and Spiritual Death. And, um, you know, we are redeemed, from, and, and the, but then the Bible tells us we're redeemed from the curse of the law. Amen? Let's look over in Galatians chapter 3. In verse 13, it says, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Now stop there. Jesus came to redeem us from the curse of the law. He became a curse for us. Now notice it did the same thing about he came to do away with the blessing of the law. Amen? Why? Because truly the blessing of the law was really the blessing of the Abrahamic covenant anyway. It was, <clears throat> those blessings weren't added. They were really part of the covenant. Do you understand what I'm saying? They became more specified. He, he was more specific about them. But really, they, the, the blessing of Abraham was to bless us, you know, bless us and bless us and increase and increase us. That would be in the arena of life. You know, um, 
Romans chapter 4 says, Surely I will bless thee and bless thee and multiply. And in multiplying, I will multiply thee. Now, the Weymouth translation says that uh, I will bless thee and bless thee and increase thee and increase thee. That was the Abraham. That was the Abrahamic covenant promise. And so, therefore, the blessings of Deuteronomy chapter twenty-eight, verses one through fourteen, were really already covered in the blessing of Abraham. So Jesus didn't come away to do with them in the first place. Now, why were they putting Deuteronomy? Because people need redundancy. Why? They get hard-headed. Amen. If you do what I say, this is going to happen to you. If you don't do what I say, this is what's going to happen to you. Amen. You split up idols, you worship idols, it's going to be bad for you. You're going to go into captivity 400 years. Anybody here, y'all going home. So Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. Not, the law now the, not that the law was the curse, but the curse of the law. See, some people try to say the law, the law was a curse. Well, no, the law was a good thing. The, actually, Paul says the law was a good thing. It was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. So, <clears throat> the reference to the curse of the law could not be that the law was a curse. It was a schoolmaster. It was to bring us to Christ. It was to bring us to faith. Amen. But it was in the Bible. Paul said that the law was good. Amen. Didn't he? So the same guy that said it was good can't be calling it the curse over here. See, some people come along, they just, they just jump off on some little, little tangent thing, and they run off the deep end with stuff. And then they, they build their, their little pet peeve doctrines and that they don't sustain, uh, they don't handle a, a, a thorough um, study or dissection of that subject. Um, and if you really, you know, but it sounds cute and it gets people all excited. And they run out and start doing, I'm not under the law. I'm not under the law. <coughs> no, I'm not under the curse. Everything that the law demanded as far as obedience and, and, and you know, you got to do this and do that was fulfilled in my faith in Christ. Amen? He is the fulfillment of the law. Isn't that right? I said, he is the fulfillment. See, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. So faith in Jesus Christ brought me into a, to a relationship with God of obedience to all that the law commanded for righteousness. And I received that by faith in Christ. Can you say amen? Now, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it's written, Curses everyone that hangeth on a tree. What? Verse 14. That the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Now notice he said that Jesus redeemed us from the curse of the law so that the blessing of Abraham might come on us. Amen? God wants the blessing to come on you. Amen? Through Christ. And then verse 29, we jump down to verse, And if you be Christ... Let me something. Let me. See. I better. Get, I better get into Galatians three. Jump over into Galatians three with me. I'm about to leave some stuff out. Let's go on and read down. We just read thirteen and fourteen, fifteen. Brethren, I speak not after the manner of men, though it be but a man's covenant. Yea. Yet, if it be a confirmed, no man disannulth or ath thereto. Verse 16. Now, to Abraham and his seed, underline seed, were the promises made, he saith not into seeds as of many, but as of one, and to that seed which is Christ. That's what I, was, I, I had left out. So God says all the promises of Abraham, the blessing of Abraham, was made to Christ and his seed. Amen? Or actually, to Abraham and his seed, and the seed of Abraham is Christ. Isn't that right? Hallelujah. And this I say, that the covenant which we confirmed before of God and Christ, the law, which was 400 years um, <clears throat> and 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. Jesus came and redeemed us from all the curses put in the law. Amen? All right. Now let's jump down to verse 27. For as many as put on... Uh, verse 26, for you are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Now look, people go around and say, everybody's the children of God. Now the Bible says you're all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. If you don't have faith in Christ Jesus, you're not a child of God. As a matter of fact, Jesus said in John the 8th chapter, the 44th verse, talking to the Pharisees and Sadducees, you're of your father the devil, and the lust of your father you will fulfill. <coughs> now, you can't come along and say we're all children of God. Jesus is telling a bunch of folks that they're the, they're the, the devil's their daddy. It sounds good. It makes people feel good. Oh, we're all God's children. Well, 
Jesus didn't say that. And I think he knows a little bit more than anybody that's got a Ph.D. behind their name. You might know every Greek word in the world, but if you don't, if you don't know Jesus or you don't know the, the heart of the Scripture, the spirit of the Scripture, you don't know what you're talking about. You can, I, I read behind one, one Greek guy, and uh, he'd say stuff like the believing sinner. Well, that's not what the Bible calls us. Called me saints. Hello? Well, he knew, he knew Greek inside and out. Well, you can know Greek inside and out and still have your theology wrong. Amen? Just because you, just cause you can you know, read a language don't make you know everything. Thank you very much. And for as many as you have, put, have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all in, one in Christ Jesus. Who? Those who are the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Now back over here he said now to Abraham and his seed was a promise made, not the seeds as of many, but as of one, which is Christ. But in verse 29 it makes it clear that if you're in Christ, you're the seed. So the blessing of Abraham comes on us. We, Jesus came and took the curse away. I'm not under the curse. I'm not under the curse. Since Jesus, he set me free. For sickness, I've health, and for poverty, wealth. Since Jesus, he ransomed me. That's a good song. It's a little jingle, you know, a little chorus. I'm not under the curse. I'm not under the curse. I'm under the blessing of Abraham. But look at what the Bible says about that over and over again. If you do this, if you do that, if you walk according to this, if you keep my commandments, even in the New Testament, that's throughout the New Testament. Uh, first John, John said, I heard some people say this, you know, don't read Peter, James, and John because they, they, they disagree with Paul, and Paul's the only one that's got the revelation. I mean, these are Bible school students running around telling everybody, don't, don't read Peter, James, and John. I'm sorry, it's Bible. Now, John said, if our heart condemns us not, then have we confidence toward God. And if we have, and if we, if we know, um, and if we have, if our heart doesn't condemn us, and we have confidence toward God, we know we have the things we ask him. And I paraphrase that a little bit. He said, if our heart condemns us not, then we have a confidence toward God. If we have confidence toward God, then we know we receive the things we ask of him. Why would your heart condemn you? Because you're disobeying. I said you're disobeying. So you can't disobey and expect God to bless you. Amen. I said, amen. You can't expect God to uphold his end when you don't uphold yours. Oh, I'm under grace. No, I'm sorry. It doesn't work that way. Now, there's mercy. God, listen, God's merciful to our unrighteousness. God's merciful when we do stuff. But you know what? He's not just going to keep blessing you and blessing you and just, you know, you're living with people and shacking up, living in sin and doing all kinds of wrong things and still expect everything to work out for you. Hello? You can't go around and tell everybody you love the Lord and I'm a homosexual and I'm a lesbian. Don't work that way. Why don't you just go and tell everybody you're a pedophile but you love the Lord? Hello? Why don't you go and tell everybody you're a thief? You're a, I, I'm a murderer but I love the Lord. The Lord loves me and he just, he just blesses me as I kill people. The first murder in Church of Greensboro. We went and kill folk and still come to church and get blessed because, we, because we're under grace. It don't matter what we do in the flesh. Waiting for somebody to shoot me. <laughs> Amen. What about the pedophilia church? You know, they're born that way. They can't help it. That's just the way they're born. I'm under grace. It don't matter what I do. I molest children, but that's okay. It's really not molestation. It's, it's just, you know, me fulfilling my, my destiny and my, my sexual orientation. And so God doesn't care because that's the way he made me. Oh, that's just gross. That's just, no, that's what the homosexual says. That's what God made them. That's what the bestiality says. That's how God made them. They just can't help it, and God bless them, and God loves them. We have the Metropolitan Community Churches where they all come together, and they just talk about how great it is to be perverse in their, in their sexual aspects of life, and God still loves them. Well, God may love you, but God doesn't, doesn't condone what you do. The love of God is not a covering for sin. Amen? It may cover a multitude of sin, but eventually you're going to have to, you're going to, have to ante up if you don't repent. Somebody got to preach this stuff. Everybody, everybody else wants to preach how God, it doesn't matter, God don't care. We're not going to talk about that in our church. We're just going to talk about who you are in Christ. Well, yeah, who you are in Christ demands you walk like who you are in Christ. I got a sermon coming on walking worthy of your vocation wherewith you were called. Amen. It's a stewing. I said it's a stewing. 
Amen. Galatians, I mean, uh, Ephesians, the fifth, fourth chapter starts out after he talks about who they were in Christ, what they had in Christ for three chapters, and says, wherefore? What's that mean? That means because of all the stuff you just read, wherefore walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. Amen. That went ever big. That always goes ever big. We, li we live in the, the mindset of, you know, it's not my fault. It's somebody else's fault. It doesn't matter what I did. You know, I, I deserve this. Have you, ever, have you heard this stuff on television? So-and-so deserves this. What made him deserve it? Because you were breathing, you deserve this? Hello? You, you walked in and you had a need and you deserve an answer? And you haven't done anything to facilitate an answer? No, it doesn't work that way in life. And it doesn't work that way with God. We walk according to his, the counsel of his word. Now, people don't like to hear that, and they don't want to hear that, and they'll, they'll turn you off. And, ah, I'm going to listen to that guy who tells me I'm going to get blessed even if I'm shacking up. You're going to get blessed with a baby and child support. Hello? And if one of y'all is sleeping around too much, you're going to get blessed with some kind of disease you don't want. Thank you for your enthusiasm. Did I get in so deep I can't get out? Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. Uh, it's written, Cursed everyone that hangeth on a tree. And if it be Christ, that be Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. The Bible is made to Abraham and his seed, not seeds as of many, but seed as of one, which is Christ. And if it be Christ, then be Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So whatever God promised Abraham, we can have it. Now, look at Galatians chapter 3. I mean, look over at, um, oh gosh, I don't have it here. Yeah, dude, Luke 13. There we go. Luke 13, 11 through 17. And behold, there was a woman which had a spirit of infirmity eight years, 18 years, 18. And was bowed together and could no wise lift up herself. And she saw, and when Jesus saw her, he called her unto him and said unto her, Woman, thou art loosed from thine infirmity. He laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. And the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation, because that Jesus had healed on the Sabbath day. And said unto the people, There are six days in which men ought to work. In them therefore come and be healed, but not on the Sabbath day. It's amazing she hadn't been healed in 18 years with them coming on the eight, six days. This clown didn't care if she got healed or not. It messed up his traditions. Are you here gone home? And Jesus answered and said unto him, I love you. You're so misunderstood we could just get you to where you weren't misunderstood you'd be a great pharisee you know what he said he didn't just slobber him with love he didn't say he didn't say, judge him he didn't say anything bad about him he didn't say that he no, uh you know you've been a bad pharisee here in the synagogue and you should have got her healed yourself he didn't do any of that he just looked at him and said i love you you know what he said no he said thou hypocrite we need preachers who've got some guts these days Instead of a bunch of weenies who are just trying to get numbers by telling people what they want to hear. Thou hypocrite, doth not each of you on the Sabbath day lose his ox or his ass from the stall and lead him away to watering? You care more about your animals. And is that not the era we live in? Peter cares more about animals than they do about people. I'll bet you if you went around and followed the crowds that protest for Peter, they're the same crowd protesting for abortion. They hate, they hate humans and love animals. I'm just guessing that's a pretty good, accurate guess, too. Are you here? And all not this woman. Now, he just rebuked him, called him a hypocrite. Called the guy a hypocrite in front of everybody. Called him out. Are you here? Oh, not this woman. Listen to what he says. The phrase he uses next, being a daughter of Abraham. What's this? It's covenant. It's covenant. He makes reference to the fact she's a covenant woman. She has a right to something because she's in covenant. Forget your traditions. Forget the fact that, you know, you hadn't got anything done in 18 years on those six days of the week. Hello. You've had, you know, we could, we could, we've had a calculator here. We can figure it out real quick. Just take 52 <clears throat> times 18, subtract that time 18 times 365, and you'll see how many shots they had at getting her healed under his method. Jesus walks in one day and just says, you're loosed. Why? Oh, not this woman being a daughter of Abraham. She's got a covenant right to it. Amen? 
She's got a covenant right to it. Ought not this woman being a daughter of Abraham, which she's under the Abrahamic covenant, be whom, whom Satan hath bound. And that's a whole other sermon <clears throat> for all the God put it on them people. When it directly states, we got two cases in the New Testament where it directly states who, who imposed sickness on people, and it's both times it's the devil. Here, here in Luke, and then over in Acts 10, 30, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good, healing all who were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Sickness is satanic oppression. It's not the tool of God. And, you know, you can sit there and argue with me all day long if you want to, but the Scripture says it's from the devil. Now, your little Ph.D. guy may have said it's from God, but the Scripture says it's from the devil. Hello. Whom Satan hath bound low these 18 years, be loosed from his bond on the Sabbath day. And when he had said these things, all his adversaries were ashamed, and all the people rejoiced for the glorious things that were done by him. Well, wow, son, when people start enforcing the covenant, people get happy. When people start acting on the covenant, people get happy. Get excited. Start rejoicing. Now, the religious folks don't get happy because they mess up their doctrine, their theology. I mean, I, I, I've taught some people, and they believe that the Shady Hook thing happened. God had a reason it happened. There was something that God had to work out with that. You loop fruit crazy. Fruit loop. I know it's fruit loop. You, you lame brain. You just believe in something like somebody spewed down you and shoved down you, and it just makes you feel better at night and lay down and think God had a reason. Instead of the church hadn't been doing her job and praying and believing God and interceding <clears throat> and waking up in the middle of the night when the Spirit of God moves on them to get up and pray to avert things that are going to happen. And that people, don't, people aren't led by the Holy Ghost and they don't hear God say stop. Now, remember the embassy bombings back in the 90s in Kenya and uh, somewhere else over in Africa? Y'all remember those? Now, Jerry Seville had ministers over there. He... he, he um, they trained them. And people, people worked in those embassies. He had people that, that were in churches that he had worked with the pastors and helped train those churches and raise those churches up and help those pastors and get them established. They had people going to work that morning. They were walking the sidewalk near the buildings. And the Spirit of God on the inside of them says, Drop to the ground right now. And they just plopped to the ground and the bomb went off. <coughs> and it blew the people away beside them. They were laying on the ground, went right over top of them. Well, why didn't God talk to the other person? He did. They just weren't listening. He that has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith. There's a lot of people who miss what God's saying and don't, don't walk in protection and safety and blessing. Um, a number of years ago, uh, back in 80, actually it was back in the winter of 81, um, we, were, we were winter Bible, it wasn't winter Bible seminar, it was prayer seminar back then. <clears throat> and um, some of the board members for Kenneth Hagin Ministries had, had come down and were in some meetings and, um, and, and, and they were getting ready to get on a plane and head back to where they come from, and, and, and Dad told says, I don't think you should go tonight. And they said, oh, no, we, we got, we're instrument rated. We got this, that, that. He, he said it twice. No, 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 they said they overrode. They overrode. Even, even with him speaking, they overrode it. So you can get so caught up with what you know in the natural and all your technology and stuff, they took off and got killed in the plane crash in the storm. And if they waited the next day, the storm had been cleared, they made it fine. I had, we got to get back. We got to get back. Well, now, you know, now what's, what's, what's worse, being late for the meeting because of bad weather or never making the meeting because you're in heaven because you didn't listen? See, there's a lot of people who don't listen and get in trouble. I don't know how I got over on that, but anyway. No, lo, Satan bound this woman, but she was a daughter of Abraham, and she should be loose. She had a covenant right to her, and Jesus loosed her from her friend based on the covenant. Can you say amen? No curses there. Amen. We're redeemed from the curse. Can you say amen? I'm not under the curse. Can you say amen? I'm redeemed from the curse. Can you say amen? amen. Hallelujah. Somebody shout glory. glory. All right. Well, praise God. I'm done.